When you play the Game of Thrones, you subscribe and like. Or you die. There is no middle ground. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome back to the Grease Comedy YouTube channel. Today's video, we are going to be doing Tyrion Nine, a Game of Thrones, the last Tyrion chapter of the book, and man, is it a good one. Uh, I think Tyrion has been. Out of all the POVs that we kind of look at in the rest of the series and go, man, Tyrion's by far one of the fan favorites. In book one, he does start quite slow, but he when he gets going, he doesn't stop uh, until probably like book five. So Tyrion 9, a uh, big chapter, right? It's a reactionary chapter to what happens at the Battle of the Whispering Wood. <clears throat> Tyrion and Catelyn chapters are quite literally just mirrors of each other, right? It's seeing what's one side's going to do, then looking at what the other side's going to do, and then going back and forth. And these chapters are just fantastic because it's going to happen once again when we go back to Rob's camp. So in Tyrion's open to his chapter, we're going to be having a conversation, um, looking at Battle of the Whispering Wood and specifically what happens at the Battle of the Camps or the Siege of River Run, and how the Lannisters are going to react, as well as some of the other information going on in the country um, about setting up the conflict for Book 2. This is a very heavy set up chapter for book two, but also a very nice conclusion for Tyrion in this first book. So let's get into it. Page 762 starts with Tywin stating that they have my son as the Craycall messenger informs him. Tyrion thinks one of his sons is reminded of his injury in his arm. Again, Tyrion throughout this chapter feels kind of left out, right? You think about how much Tywin is putting on Jaime being captured, and if you think about it, if that was Tyrion, Tywin would not really care as much about Tyrion's life, especially given in the last chapter, Tyrion was kind of supposed to lose and or die, like he was put in the vanguard basically for slaughter almost, and so that's a lot of it the forefront of his mind. Tyrion notes he loves his brother, but he would not have wanted to be with him in the Whispering Wood, and by all accounts, if you're hearing about the Whispering Wood, it sounds horrible this ambush in the woods, no one's there to help you or save you. It's got to be quite frightening, especially with a dire wolf coming in. It's not something you'd want to be in, especially for Tyrion, who's not a great fighter. All of Ty Tywin's captains and bannermen were, were, were gathered as the messenger told the tale of Jaime's capture, all the while in complete sullen silence. Remember the, remember the Lannister camp thought that they had a very easy victory, right? It, it seems like it was building towards this conflict between Tywin and Rob. All the scouts said the Northern Army was coming south, and to a degree, that's correct. It's just it's not where Rob was. It's not where they really were trying to strike. That's not where they were really trying to strike. So it's just this blow that's like the Lannisters went from, you know, 100 to zero very quickly. They lose a huge portion of their forces. Jamie being their military commander for their other army, is captured it puts them in a very bad position. Tyrion thinks how they had driven south in a hurry back after the Battle of the Green Fork. Once you realize that Rob's true intentions were not this battle, you've got to hurry to get to Jaime, and that's what they've been doing. They've been marching south very quickly to getting back to the Crossroad Inn. And Tyrion was happy to find some luxury in, in an inn instead of, you know, camping out every single night and, you know, having to travel for quite a long time, not getting a lot of rest. But unfortunately, as the crossroad in, a lot of bad history here for Tyrion. But Tyrion notes it had been a hard journey south, where the wounded struggled to keep up, and if they couldn't, were left behind. Really paints the cruelty of war, right? All these men just went to battle and died and lost limbs, did all these things for you, and the least you could do is try to give them medical attention or, you know, try to respect them in some way. But no, Tywin leaves them to die. Uh, it paints a very grueling image of war, and, you know, this is a very realistic thing that happens. You know, if you're injured and you can't make it to a medical station or whatnot, you're going to be left behind because, you know, if you're trying to win a war, you've got to be able to maneuver quickly. And so you can understand where Tywin's coming from and why he's doing all these things, but at the same time, it just shows war is not a pretty sight. That gets us into page 763. Also, guys, I'm sorry for my hair being so wild. I just got back from a walk, and it's very hot today, so ignore that. <laughs> but every morning they awoke to fresh corpses where men did not wake from sleep, men being left behind or others stowing away in the night, and Tyrion had half a mind to leave with them. The other thing, about, other thing you have to think about here, the Lannister position is very much in doubt. Like we're going to talk about in this chapter in terms of this council meeting and all that, the Lannisters are now at probably an equal footing with the Starks in terms of troop count and all of that um, that's on the playing field. 
Plus now Rob has a captive. You know, he has a prisoner, a very valuable hostage. Everything's flipped on its head. Instead of it now being a situation where the Lannisters are dominating, it seems like there's no shot Rob is going to win. Now you have an equal sized force with the Starks gaining the Riverland forces. You also have other things going on in the world where the crown is very insecure in terms of you have Stannis, who knows what he's going to do. Renly, there's been some things being said that he has made himself king and he's coming up north. It's not looking good. So, of course, men are going to desert. You know, when you're seeing men being left behind and dying and all this, you're going to try and leave. You What, what point do you have staying here for a losing cause? That's the biggest thing, right? In this way of war, you need to make your you need to reassure your you need to reassure your men that you're going to win or you at least have a chance of winning or you need to be very well loved or you need to be you know very well feared which Tywin is but it's not people are overcoming that right it's almost a life and death situation is how a lot of people feel at this time Tyrion thinks how he had been upstairs in the inn with Shay when he had heard the news of River Run and that their journey south had been for nothing as Rob had reached the castle days and days ago not only that are you seeing you know wasted lives it was all for nothing right this quick movement south didn't matter right all these people being left behind or dying because of the harsh march south died for nothing harris swift notes how could this happen even after the whispering wood jamie had a great host why split them into three camps and obviously obviously harris swift is just not a very bright guy like how else would you siege river run I mean, look at a map. That's all you've got to do or read any history about the land you're conquering. It's not hard to understand why you would split your army into three camps. It's why River Run's so difficult to take. And also, it's a little bit of hindsight, right? You're also looking at the idea, not only are they separating camps, but they didn't know they were being attacked. They had no information based upon what was happening right now. They had no idea a Stark army was upon them. So you can't blame them too much. But Tyrion thinks bitterly that Jaime knows better than him as his only relevance is his daughter married Kevin Lannister, and he hated hearing Jaime being slandered. Again, it really paints that idea of how close Tyrion and Jaime are, as well as just this guy, Harris Swift, talking this big game, but he's really kind of a nobody at this point. Kevin notes he would have done the same. River Run has a strong position, given it is an island that the land separates because of the adjoining bodies of water with the Red Fork and Tumbleton. Like we talked about, it's just a very defensible castle, right? It has a bunch of different rivers and it meets in a lot of bays of water so that you have a situation in which you're, all your camps really cannot be combined. And if they are combined and say one side or another, well, you're not sieging the castle because then they can go forest and get resources on the other side where you're not currently at. Again, why it makes it so difficult to siege. And Kevin continues saying, for one to properly siege it, they must have three camps to which the messenger agrees. And the, the messenger notes that with the camps cut off, their defenses made no matter. Again, they had defenses. It was a good defensible position, but it just didn't go that well when you're getting attacked in the night, unexpected. It just did not go well for the Lannisters. They were hit from the north first. They had believed it was simply Mark Piper who had been harassing them the night before with only around 50 men. But they had no warning and had been told the Stark host was on the east of the Green Fork, marching south. The Mountain asks, what about their outriders? Had they seen anything? The messenger notes they had been disappearing or coming back seeing nothing. The Mountain says to cut their eyes out and give them to the next man as more eyes should be able to see something. The Mountain's not entirely wrong, right? If your outriders are going disappearing, if your outriders are disappearing or coming back seeing nothing, it's quite weird that they're disappearing. I, I don't think that's that uncommon, though, right? I don't think you can judge them, right? All the information points to the north was on the other that the Starks were on the other side. It just seems like, okay, maybe they were getting sprung upon by rebel forces like Mark Piper, and the Riverlands don't like the Lannisters. It's that simple. So the only other solution is what Tywin is going to suggest closer to the end of the chapter, where if you're sending out Outriders, you just got to send out more. You got to send them in larger parties to where people are not going to mess with them as much. And then if they do, it's going to become like almost a little skirmish. So I still don't blame Jamie's, you know, battle strategy or his, his camp that much but yeah Tyrion tried to study tywin's face but his face gave nothing of what he thought tywin often sat in silence letting his counsel speak before he did something that Tyrion himself tried to emulate and it's a very smart tactic right let everybody you know say their grievances or say what they want to say taking all the diff different informations and what people think we should do and then look at them all and pick what you think is the best idea it's a very smart thing that tywin does and that Tyrion also picks up on 
Kevin notes the attack happened at night, and the messenger agrees, noting the Blackfish led the attack, taking out their outriders and defenses, and then the main assault began. There was nothing they could do as the North Camp went down in moments. The West Camp, where the messenger was sleeping, tried to rally under Lord Brax, and they tried to pull over, but the river drove them too close to the Tullys, and their catapults brought down some of their ships, while any man who made the North Bank was made was met by the Stark Force. It was incredibly stupid to do this. Uh, I, I don't think I need to tell you guys how dumb that actually was. Also, I forgot to change the page, but we are now on page 765. But just incredibly stupid. It's in the middle of the night. The North Camp is separated by a body of water. It's going to be very difficult to get there, especially in the night. And when you do, you just end up getting massacred. Just very, very stupid like Tyrion's going to talk about. But a Sir Flemont Brax, the one who kind of has like the unicorn horn on, he's very noticeable uh, in his early chapters. But he seems horrified by this and asks about his father's safety. But he is told his ship went down with him still in his armor. Not only are you trying to s sail a boat in the middle of the night, you're also wearing full plate armor. So if you fall off, you're dead, more or less. This is not Game of Thrones Season 7 where Jamie goes into the water and somehow he's able to get back up. No, you're dead. Tyrion thinks this man is a fool leading men over water at night in armor. He wonders if Brax felt gallant drowning in the river. But the camp between the rivers also had no chance. While they tried to reinforce the other camps, the Umbers, Malisters, and Rob himself attacked them. The shield wall held the first attack, but when the Tully saw the battle turning, they opened the gates and Titus Blackwood attacked them in the rear. Great John Umber burned the siege towers and Lord Blackwood found and freed Edmure. South Camp, under the command of Sir Presley, attempted to retreat, seeing the camps lost, but the 2,000 Tyroshi with them went over to their foes. Everything just goes wrong, right? As soon as you see this battle starting to break down, you're not able to support the northern camp. It goes down in, in seems like, moments. Your, your camp really blockading the central part of River Run. You're being assaulted by the well, basically the best part of the Stark Force. At this time, the, the Tully is like, well, hell, I mean, why sit here? Right? Why sit here? We're already, seems like we're about to win the battle. Might as well gain, get in. The big part of this is that Edmure is able to be freed before he's like killed or something. That's a key moment that is really, I think, even more damaging. If you're going to lose Edmure as a prisoner, you'd rather him just die than him actually escape or be freed. But things just go bad. Also, we kind of see an introduction into cell swords. This is kind of our first introduction in the way Westerosi views cell swords and kind of what happens a lot with them in terms of flipping sides. We'll see a bit more of that and something that Tywin does not take note of. He also has kind of cell swords more or less in his army, and he doesn't take the note of here, right? He sees that this happened during the Battle of the Camps and does nothing. Kevin curses the man, and he says he told Jamie not to trust that one. A man who fights for gold is only loyal to his purse. Tyrion once again studies his father, who still hides his real thoughts, but seems now to be sweating. Once again, Hera Swift asks, how could this happen? And Tywin, I think there's a lot of things going on right now. Tywin is just furious because of everything that ended up happening, in terms of just being outsmarted by Rob Stark, who he views as a boy. His counselors just seem ignorant outside of like Kevin and Tyrion hasn't said anything really yet at this time, but the people have talking outside of Kevin just seem stupid at this time. It's a lot of things going on right now in, Ty in Tywin's mind as he's trying to figure out what to do. He continues noting that Jamie taken, siege is broken, it is a catastrophe. And Adam Arburn thanks him for stating the obvious and asks what they're going to do about it. Harris continues stating, what can we do? Jamie's host is in ruins, their supply line is cut, the Starks can attack Castle Rock now, and that they should sue for peace. Harris is very, 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 very short-sighted and doesn't seem to think about what's really going on in the political state of Westeros. Yes, all those things are correct, right? Jamie's host is scattered, destroyed more or less. Um, they are now cut off from the West, right? Because Riverland, the River Run has a very commanding position on allowing the Lannisters to retreat into the West. They're in a really bad spot. How are they going to resupply themselves? So, with that being said, you still can't sue for peace, right? Rob believes he's winning now, and also you've just cut off his father, says. His father's head. So, Tyrion's going to note this exactly. Tyrion chooses now to pipe up saying, peace? He swirled his cup, then flung it, breaking the cup. 
He notes there is your peace. It is, it is broken. There is no chance for peace since Joffrey took off Ned's head. He would have a better chance drinking from that cup than making peace with Rob, who, if he hasn't noticed, is winning the war. Everything Tyrion says right here? Correct. Sir Adam notes two battles do not make a war, which is also which is also true. A lot can happen in terms of just, you know, years or however long the, the war goes. He would like to try his steel with Rob, and Lord Lefford pipes up noting maybe they would accept a truce in a trading of prisoners, which, again, is stupid. Uh, it makes sense in terms of what Lefford is saying, and there, you should always try it, right? If they could try to do a truce, that would be very beneficial in terms of could we trade prisoners? But they're just not in that position right now. They need, they're now on the opposite side of this, right? Whereas Rob was the one that needed to make it look like they were winning and they could get a hostage like, like Tywin or Jamie to switch for Ned. The opposite is now true. Now the Lannisters need to do something to equal out the balance of power. And Tyrion also denies this as well, as they would lose prisoners three to one, as well as what do they have to trade for Jamie? Ned's rotting head? Lefford notes that Cersei has the sisters of Rob, they could trade them, but Marbra notes Rob would have to be stupid to do that, which is also very true. Rob has no reason to get rid of N Jamie at all, and Lefford continues because he just doesn't take the hint. He notes that they must pay Jamie's ransom at all costs, which Tyrion just rolls his eyes at. If the Starks want gold, they would just melt down Jamie's armor or do other stuff, but this is the issue. If Rob was to allow Jamie to be freed, like, he freed him. His bannermen would desert him. I mean, they would desert him. If he traded them for two girls, right? And again, remember in this world, the value on children is more on the men, right? Because Jamie's a commander. He's one of the best sword fighter in a war. Jamie's a more valuable prisoner right now. Today's standards, it's not the same, right? You know, your two of your sisters, your brother. It... it yeah, let's just leave it at that. But in terms of the war right now, it makes literally no sense for Rob to ever let go of Jamie as a prisoner at all. Ever. Like, there, there's no reason to. And that's why Tywin has a shift in terms of how he treats Tyrion in this chapter. Adam argues they cannot make a truce. It would make them seem weak. They should march on them at once. And Harris notes that surely their friends at court could raise them fresh troops and someone could be sent back to the West to gather a new host. Which, not entirely wrong. I don't know about court, though. They're going to need those men against Renly and Stannis. But in terms of raising a new host at West and in the Westerlands, definitely correct. You have more manpower to do so. Might as well start bringing up fresh troops. But at this, though, Tywin enters the conversation, saying, They have my son in a voice that cut through them all. He continues saying, Leave me, all of you. And Tywin goes, Commander voice. That thing that Ned talks about that Robert really had that you need to command troops, Tywin has it here. He silences all discussion, he silences, he silences all bickering, and he chooses now as his moment to figure out what he will do. Tyrion rose, almost in blind obedience, but Tywin says, not him, and also Kevin. Tyrion was shocked by this and asked Kevin to pour him some wine as well, but Tywin offers his cup to him, once again leaving Tyrion speechless as he drinks. Tyrion has never really felt like this, right? Tyrion has never been a part of Tywin's inner circle, right? Or of being part of the war councils. Think about the last war council he was in. He got told he was in the vanguard and they basically laughed him off of the feast, right? There has been no reason for Tyrion to be in a situation like this because when jamie has been around, he's the golden child. He's the one being in all these plans and all this and being groomed to rule. This might be the first time Tyrion has maybe felt like he is valued. And for Tywin, it makes complete sense, right? Tyrion has shown that he has some wit. You may hate Tyrion, and Ty Tywin does, but you have to understand his value. And Tywin is blatantly using Tyrion. It, it, let's get that clear. Everything that Tywin does is for his own benefit and is for his own use of people. When that use runs out, they're discarded. Think about what happens when Tywin comes to King's Landing. So that's what's all going through here. Tywin is playing on that idea that Tyrion you know, wants to be loved. He wants someone to actually care about him, to respect him, all those things. So Tywin's going to give him a little bit of that to make him bite, to do what Tywin wants him to do. But Tywin notes that Tyrion had the right of it about the Starks, and if Ned was alive, they could broker a peace to buy them time to deal with Stannis and Renly. It was complete madness. Again, just agreeing with what Tyrion said earlier, because he's right. 
Tyrion points out that Joffrey is only a boy, and Tyrion himself made a few follies in his youth. It's interesting that Tyrion's kind of defending Joffrey a little bit. Now, it is just a very loose defense, but still, it is interesting. It also points out to the things that we know Tyrion has done in the past that his father was not happy about, specifically Tysha. And Tywin, not happy that this is brought up. He responds sharply to this, saying, yes, he hasn't married a whore yet. Tyrion thinks about throwing his wine in his father's face, but his father continues noting their position is worse than it seems. They have a new king. But think about the transition of when we go to book three, when Tyrion does kill Tywin. Tyrion is still very obedient to his father. His father is still manipulating Tyrion, and Tyrion's falling into it. But not in book three. And that change is Tyrion breaks as a character. So I just want you guys to keep that in mind as we go forward with these rereads. And I probably won't get to book three in a while. But just something interesting to have in the back of your mind. Because a lot of the preparation to that dynamic that we're going to see between Tywin and Tyrion in book three starts in this. Kevin seems perplexed by this, noting what happened to Joffrey. As if we have a new king, well, what happened to Joffrey? Tywin, with a bit of distaste, notes nothing yet. He still sits at the Iron Throne, but Renly has married Marjorie, it would seem, and been declared king with all their bannermen in support. This is just horrible news. Renly now commands way more men than the Lannisters do. It, it brings up another threat to Tywin, right? In terms of, he already knew Stannis was going to be a threat at some point, but he didn't know when. But now you bring in the, the, the Tyrells and Baratheons being united under one banner. The war is going very, very, very poorly right now for Tywin. Kevin notes the grave tidings, but Tywin notes that Cersei commands Tywin to go south to help them against Renly using the authority of the council and king. Big mistake. Um, you do not order Tywin to do anything. Uh, Cersei did not learn from the Mad King. The Mad King did the exact same thing and Tywin refused it, or showed up and then killed them all. So, not the best idea to do, but that gets us into page 768. Tyrion asks how Joffrey is taking the news, and Tywin says apparently she has not told him, in fear of Joffrey marching to meet Renly. Of course, Cersei's not going to tell him. Joffrey has shown that he cannot be controlled by Cersei. Who knows what sporadic action or idiotacy he would do. And also, Joffrey meeting Renly in Battlefield. He would die in three seconds. And Tyrion's amused by this, asking what army? Like, what army do what army does Joffrey command? And Tywin notes apparently the gold cloaks. If he takes them, the city will be ripe for taking by Stannis, Kevin notes. More foreshadowing to something we may see in House of the Dragon. But yeah, just very stupid, horrible battle strategy. Tywin then turns to Tyrion, telling him he saw him as a fool, but perhaps he was wrong. And Tyrion doesn't really know how to take this. It almost sounds like a, a compliment to Tyrion, but again, it's just more manipulation. It's Tywin trying to get Tyrion to do something for him and making him be useful, more or less. Tyrion then asks, what of Stannis? He is the elder brother. What does he think about what Renly is doing? And Tywin notes all they know is whispers. He is gathering ships, men, and a priestess from a shy, but he does nothing as of yet. But Tywin does note he is the true danger. And of course, Stannis is the true danger. He is the mil best military commander that is in Westeros at the moment. He is someone that, yes, he may not have the most amount of men, most amount of things going on, but he is a very hard person in terms of like, there will be no peace until Stannis is on the throne. There's no convincing of a truce or a peace. He is the true danger. And this is all building up to the Stannis plotline in book two, which is really done very well here by George to bring this up now. Sir Kevin is bid to bring the map, and Tywin explains their position to the north. The twins and Moat Kaelin is held against them, with Roos at command of their forces. To the west, Rob has them cut off. Beric and Thoros have been harassing their foraging parties. To the east, the Arryns and Stannis lie, and the south, Renly's camp. In other words, they should be fucked. There is nowhere for them to really go. There are armies on every side of them. But Tyrion japes, noting at least Rhaegar is still dead. And Tywin frowns, noting he thought Tyrion would be of more use. As Kevin frowns at the maps, noting they cannot stay here. They will be pinned in between three armies. And, yeah, it's quite obvious they can't stay here. I don't know why you would stay at the Crossroad Inns for a significant amount of time, especially given what is going on. But that gets us into page 769. Tywin notes he has no intention of staying here. They must deal with the Starks before Renly marches on Highgarden. And that's the biggest issue that the Lancers have. 
They cannot sustain a prolonged conflict with the Starks. They have to be dealt with quickly. That's the biggest issue the Lannisters have, because if they allow the Starks to just do whatever, they're going to have no forces then send to go against Stannis or Renly. Tywin notes they will move to Harrenhal. Roose is a wary man and has been made warier. He will come south slowly. Again, Roose is going to be very wary of traps, not wanting to lose men. He's already proven that he's a very wary um, leader. That's why he was made the leader of this army. Kevin is to give Adam Marbrand more men for screening their movements and have more men in screening parties like I talked about earlier. Just makes sense to do, especially with a lot of them being picked off by the Blackfish and the Brotherhood Without Banners. And he also commands Gregor, Lorch, and Vargo host to set the Riverlands ablaze. This will have repercussions later on. Kevin notes it is curse, to which Tywin does not care, and in reference to Harrenhal. Kevin notes that they will burn and leaves. Now it's just Tywin and Tyrion. Very awkward, because I feel like these two are almost never left alone. Tywin then allows for Tyrion's mountain clans to also join these raiding parties if they would like to pillage as they like, but Tyrion does not want this at all. Tyrion wants as many men around him to keep his position somewhat powerful, to have some sort of relevance, and he's definitely not trying to give that army to his father. And this is where I want to do a reading as we'll get into the rest of page 769 and then also page 770. Then he would best learn to control them. I will not have the city plundered. The city, Tyrion was lost. What city would that be? A king's landing. I am sending you to court. It was the last thing Tyrion Lannister would ever have anticipated. He reached for his wine and considered for a moment as he sipped. And what am I to do there? Rule, his father said curtly. Tyrion hooted with laughter. My sweet sister might have a word or two to say about that. Let her say what she likes. Her son needs to be taken in hand before he ruins us all. I blame those jackanapes on the council, our friend Peter, the venerable Grand Maester, and the cockless wonder Lord Varys. What, for, what sort of council are they giving Joffrey when he lurches from one folly to the next? Whose notion was it to make this Janus slint a lord? The man's father was a butcher, and they gave him Harrenhal. Harrenhal, that was the seat of kings. Not that he will ever set foot inside of it, if I have a say. I am told he took a bloody spear for his sigil. A bloody cleaver would have, had, would have been my choice. His father had not raised his voice, yet Tyrion could see the anger and the gold, gold of his eyes. And dismissing Selmy, where was the sense in that? Yes, the man was old, but the name of Barristan the Bold still has meaning in the realm. He lent honor to any man he served. Can anyone say the same of the Hound? You feed your dog's bones under the table. You do not seat him beside you on the high bench. He pointed a finger at Tyrion's face. If Cersei cannot curb the boy, you must. And if these counselors are playing us for false, Tyrion knew. Spikes, he said. Heads, walls. And yeah, this basically just goes over what we've talked about in all of the retrospect and all of these rereads. King's Landing is a shit show right now. There's been so many missteps by Cersei, the council, Joffrey. So many things have festered and now put their position in a very bad spot. And so Tyrion's being sent to fix all these issues, which we'll see in book two. But in a lot of ways, why would Tywin give him this position? Well, because Tyrion is the only hope that Tywin has, right? Court is going badly. Tywin cannot afford to go there himself. So why not use Tyrion's talents? He might not like Tyrion, but he needs Tyrion in this moment. That's the difference between what's going on here is that Tyrion is someone that Tywin recognizes is quite clever and smart, but is not willing to admit it more, more most of the time. But there's also something else we'll talk about that Tyrion's going to bring up because he also questions this. Like, what is going on? Why would this happen? Tyrion's gone from this being like his first real like war council where he has some say to now being the hand of the king. Very interesting. But Tywin notes he has listened to some of his lessons, and Tyrion notes more than he knows, and he felt very conflicted. And and you got to think about this from Tyrion's point of view. On one hand, it's pride. It's this recognition finally be, being given some faith by your father. But at the same time, the last chapter, Tywin planned for Tyrion to more or less be killed, or at least be in a very good position to die. Was this another one of those? Was this another Battle of the Green Fork? Was he being sent to die? Tyrion asks, why me? Why not any of the bigger men or lords? A, gr a really good question by Tyrion. And Tywin responds coolly that he is his son. And this is all Tyrion needed to know. Because Tywin never seems to talk about that in a good light up until now. 
Well, why does he do that? And Tyrion picks up on it immediately. He believes that Jaime is gone, that Tyrion is all that Tywin has left. He wanted to slap and kill Tywin to see if he had a golden old heart, but he sat there in silence. And a part of me believes that Tyrion also realizes that Jaime's in a bad spot. I mean, there is very, very, very little chance that Jaime will actually live through this conflict. And so if you're Tywin, you're in a really bad spot. Because when you die, who gets Casterly Rock, right? The plan was always for Tywin to get Jaime off of the King's Guard to then take as the Lord of Casterly Rock. If Jaime's dead, there's no chance of that. So who gets Casterly Rock? Is it Tyrion? Is it Kevin? Is it Tommen? Is it somebody that marries Marcella? You're in a really weird spot. And so I think Tywin recognizes that, you know, hovering that little fruit over Tyrion, that yes, you're my heir, is a great way of motivating Tyrion to go to King's Landing and do a great job, even if Tywin does not actually mean to give Tyrion any praise, give him anything after, if he does good service. It's a very interesting manipulation that's going on here by Tywin. Tyrion stared at his broken wine cup, but Tywin notes one more thing before he goes. You will not bring that whore to court. Again, referencing that Tywin knows Tyrion's sleeping around with a whore, and how could he not? Right? If you have the same camp follower coming to your room or your tent all the time, it's going to be pretty easy to pick up on. But Tyrion stayed in the common room for some time. And one other thing that's important to understand is the reason Tywin specifically notes that instead of anything else that Tyrion's been doing is because it's the one flaw that Tywin himself has. It's that one thing because he sees his faults in Tyrion. It's that really difficult thing where you can see yourself and your parents, or they can see themselves in you, and you recognize, recognize those flaws that they have, but, they, but you also recognize that they're in you as well. It's something that I really struggle with because I see some of the faults in my parents, and I, I notice that I have them as well. And so I try to you know fix those things and curb those things. It's exactly what Tywin and Tyrion's relationship is here. It's just a very toxic way of it, and it's a way that neither... That, that Tywin can never really recognize Tyrion for, for who he is. But eventually, Tyrion does go back to his room, noting the old dead hanged innkeep. As he enters, he sees Shay and begins to touch her, and whispers that he has a mind to take her to court. And that is the end of Book 1 Tyrion. It's a fantastic way to end out this arc, again, showing that defiance of Tyrion, and just even in little ways that he is not completely under Tywin's thumb, and it's a great way to end it, right? Because we build up this relationship between Tywin and Tyrion and putting up Tyrion in a place of power, something he's never had before. And book two will be all about his ascent to power and then his inevitable losing of power. But let me know what you guys all thought about Tyrion 9 A Game of Thrones. It's a fantastic chapter. And we will be doing Jon in the next chapter. And then we'll be finishing out with Catelyn and Daenerys, getting very close to the end. I hope you guys all have enjoyed the series and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.